Do you love art? I mean, do you make plans, maybe even an entire trip or vacation, just to go see art? You see, I love art. I always have. And just what is art? There are so many different types of art. There's theater, music, painting, sculpture, writing and sketching. I mean, just to name a few. And I love all forms of art. And I've lived in the world of the arts my entire life. So I thought that on today's episode of The Secret Sits, we would cover an art case. And not just any art case. Today, we are going to discuss the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. During this heist, 13 works of art would be stolen with a cumulative value of 500 million US dollars. There is still a reward offered for 10 million US dollars for information leading to the art's recovery. So listen closely because maybe you know secrets that could get you that 10 million dollars. I want to start this story with a little background on the museum. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum was constructed under the guidance of art collector Isabella Stewart Gardner, who lived from 1840 to 1924 to house her personal art collection. The museum opened to the public in 1903, and Gardner continued to expand the collection and arrange it until she died in 1924. She left the museum with a $3.6 million endowment, and her will stipulated that the arrangement of the artwork should not be altered, and no items were to be sold or bought into the collection. You see, many museums will rotate through different notable artworks or collections. When you go to the Met in Manhattan, the display will be slightly or dramatically different than the last time you visited. That is precisely what Isabella did not want for her museum. By the 1980s, the museum was running low on funds. This financial strain left the museum in poor condition. It lacked a climate control system and an insurance policy, and was in need of basic building maintenance. After the Federal Bureau of Investigation uncovered a plot by Boston criminals to rob the museum in 1982, the museum allocated funds to improve security. Among these improvements were 60 infrared motion detectors and a closed circuit television system consisting of four cameras placed around the building's perimeter. There were no cameras installed within as the board of trustees thought installing such equipment in the historical building would be too expensive. More security guards were hired as well. Despite these security improvements, the only way police could be summoned to the museum was with a button at the security desk. Other museums at the time had fail-safe systems which required night watchmen to make hourly phone calls to the police to indicate that all was well. An independent security consultant reviewed the museum's operations in 1988 and determined they were on par with most other museums, but recommended improvements. The security director at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston also suggested security upgrades to the museum. Because of the museum's financial strain and Miss Gardner's wishes against any major renovations, the Board of Trustees did not approve these security enhancements. The board also denied a request from the security director for higher guard salaries in a bid to attract more qualified applicants for the job. The current guards were paid slightly above minimum wage. The security flaws of the museum were an open secret amongst the guards. The robbery occurred in the early hours of Sunday, March 18th, 1990. The thieves were first witnessed around 12.30 a.m. by several St. Patrick's Day revelers leaving a party near the museum. The two men were disguised as police officers and parked in a hatchback on Palace Road, about 100 feet from the side entrance. The witnesses believed them to be policemen. The museum guards on duty that night were Rick Abbott, age 23, and Randy Heston, 
age 25. Abbott was a regular night watchman, and it was Heston's first time on the night shift. The security policy maintained that one guard patrolled the galleries with a flashlight and walkie-talkie, while the other sat at the security desk. Abbott went on patrol first. During his patrol, fire alarms sounded off in different rooms in the museum, but he could not locate any fire or smoke. Abbott returned to the security room, where the fire alarm control panel indicated smoke in multiple rooms. He assumed some type of malfunction and shut down the panel. I mean, when something doesn't work, what do you do? Turn it off, then turn it back on. He went back on patrol, and before he completed his rounds, he made a quick stop at the side entrance of the museum, briefly opening the side door and then shutting it again. He did not tell Heston he was doing this or why. Abbott completed his tour and returned to the security desk around 1 a.m., at which point Heston began his rounds. At 1.20 a.m., the thieves drove up to the side entrance, parked, and walked up to the side door. They rang the buzzer, which connected them to Abbott through an intercom. They explained to Abbott that they were police investigating a disturbance and needed to be buzzed in. Abbott could see them on the closed-circuit television wearing what appeared to be real policemen uniforms. He was not aware of any disturbance, but thought that as it was St. Patrick's Day, perhaps a partier had climbed over the fence and someone had seen and reported it. Abbott let the men in at 1.24 a.m. The thieves were let into a locked foyer that separated the side door from the museum. They approached Abbott at his desk and asked if anyone else was in the museum and to bring them down. Abbott radioed Heston to return to the security desk. Abbott noticed around this time that the mustache on the taller man appeared to be fake. The shorter man told Abbott that he looked familiar, that they may have a warrant for his arrest, and to come out from behind the desk and provide identification. Abbott complied, stepping away from the desk, where the only panic button to alert police was. The shorter man forced Abbott against a wall, spread his legs, and handcuffed him. Abbott noticed that he was not frisked. Heston walked into the room around this time, and the taller thief turned him around and handcuffed him. Once both guards were handcuffed, the thieves revealed their true intentions to rob the museum and asked the guards to not give them any problems. The thieves wrapped duct tape around the heads and eyes of the guards. Without asking for directions, they led the guards down into the basement where they were handcuffed to a steam pipe and a workbench. The thieves examined the wallets of the guards and explained that they know where they live and to not tell authorities anything and they'll receive a reward in about a year. It had taken the thieves 11 minutes to subdue the guards. It was now 1.35 a.m. The thieves' movements through the museum were recorded on infrared motion detectors. Steps into the first room they entered, the Dutch room on the second floor, were not recorded until 1.48 a.m. This was 13 minutes after they finished subduing the guards, perhaps waiting to make sure no police were alerted. As the thieves approached the paintings in the Dutch room, a device began beeping that would normally trip when a patron was too close to the paintings. The thieves attempted to silence the alarm, but when they could not, they just smashed it. They took Storm on the Sea of Galilee and a lady and gentleman in black and threw them on the marble floor, which shattered their glass frames. Using a blade, they cut the canvases out of their stretchers. Now, let me just say, my husband and I do collect art ourselves. And when I told my husband about this story, and I got to the part when the thieves cut the canvases out of their stretchers, Gabriel just cringed and a shiver ran down his back. Because the canvas of the art is usually the most expensive part of the art. And even the portion of the canvas that is wrapped around the stretchers could still have actual painting from the original artist on it, which would also be highly valuable. 
and I say, usually, the most expensive part because there are some art pieces where the frame is actually more expensive than the piece of art hung in the frame. The thieves also removed a large Rembrandt self-portrait oil painting from the wall, but left it leaning against a cabinet. Investigators believe they may have considered it too large to transport, potentially because it was a painting on wood, not more durable canvas like the others. Instead, the thieves took a small postage stamp size self-portrait etching by Rembrandt on display beneath the larger portrait. On the right side of the room, they removed landscape with obelisk and the concert from their frames. The final piece taken from the room was an ancient Chinese goo. What is an ancient Chinese goo? Well, I will get into that in just a little bit. It is now 1.51 a.m. While one thief continued working in the Dutch room, the other entered a narrow hallway dubbed the Short Gallery on the other end of the second floor. In this room, they began removing screws from a frame displaying a Napoleonic flag, likely an effort to steal the flag. They appeared to have given up partway through as not all the screws were removed and ultimately only took the exposed eagle finial atop the flagpole. They also took five Degas sketches from the room. The last work stolen was Chez Tortoni from the Blue Room on the first floor. The museum's motion detectors did not detect any motion within the Blue Room during the thieves' time in the building. The only footsteps detected in the room that night were Abbott's during the two times he passed through the gallery on his patrol earlier. As they prepared to leave, the thieves checked on the guards one last time and asked if they were comfortable. What nice thieves. They then moved to the security director's office where they took the video cassettes that recorded their entrance on the closed circuit cameras and the data printouts from the motion detecting equipment. The movement data was still captured on a hard drive, which remained untouched. The frame for Chez Tortoni was left at the security director's desk. The thieves then moved to take the artwork out of the museum. The side entrance doors were opened once at 2.40 a.m. and again for the last time at 2.45 a.m. The entire robbery lasted 81 minutes. The next shift of guards arrived later in the morning and realized something was amiss when they could not establish contact with anyone inside to be let in. They called in a security director who, upon entering the building with his keys, found nobody at the watch desk and called police. The police searched the building until they found the guards still tied up in the basement. In total, 13 works of art were stolen. In 1990, the FBI estimated the value of the hall at 200 million US dollars and raised this estimate to 500 million by the year 2000. In the late 2000s, some art dealers suggested the hall could be worth 600 million. It was considered the largest museum heist in terms of value until it was surpassed by the Dresden Green Vault burglary in 2019. Now let's get into the art, which is my favorite part. The most valuable works were taken from the Dutch room. Among these were the concert by Dutch painter Vermeer. One of the only 34 paintings attributed to him in his life. And if you know nothing about art and how it is priced, I'll tell you this. The more rare the work, or if it's an artist like Vermeer who did not produce many pieces during their lifetime, it is going to be expensive. This painting accounts for almost half of the entire hall's value, estimated at $250 million in 2015. Experts believe it may be the most valuable stolen object in the world. The concert by Vermeer measures 28 and a half by 25 and a half inches and shows three musicians, a young woman sitting at a harpsichord, a man playing a lute, and a woman who is singing. The harpsichord's upturned lid is decorated with an Arcadian landscape, 
Its bright coloring stands in contrast to the two paintings hanging on the wall, to the right and the left. A viola can be seen lying on the floor. The musician's clothing and surroundings identify them as members of the upper bourgeoisie. The male lute player, for instance, wears a shoulder belt and a sword. Despite its simplicity, the black and white marble flooring is luxurious and expensive. Of the two paintings in the background, the one on the right is the Procurus by Dirk van Baburen, which belonged to the Vermeer's mother-in-law, Maria Thins. The work also appears in his Lady Seated at a Virginal, probably painted some six years after the concert. The painting on the left is a wild pastoral landscape. The musical theme in Dutch painting in Vermeer's time often implied love and seduction, but in this case, the feeling is more ambiguous. Even before the actual robbery, the theft of this painting was the subject of a 1964 episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour called Ten Minutes From Now. Following the real theft, the stolen painting has figured in TV and animated series as well as two novels, An Object of Beauty by Steve Martin in 2010, The Medusa Plot by Gordon Corman in 2011, and in Tracy Chevalier's historical novel Girl with a Pearl Earring in 1999. Vermeer paints the concert at the same time he is painting Girl with a Pearl Earring, an event also portrayed in the 2003 film adaptation. Now in this same room, the thieves targeted works by Dutch painter Rembrandt, probably an artist that most people have heard of, even if they couldn't identify any of his works. These works included The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, his one and only seascape, and the most valuable of his works stolen that night. Estimates have placed its value at over $100 million since the robbery. The other Rembrandt works taken were A Lady and Gentleman in Black and a small postage stamp size self-portrait etching. The thieves may have taken Landscape with Obelisk, believing it was a Rembrandt, as it was long attributed to him until it was quietly credited to his pupil, Govert Flink, a few years before the heist. The storm on the Sea of Galilee is brilliant. The painting is horizontal format and shows a close-up view of Christ's disciples struggling frantically against the heavy storm to regain control of their fishing boat. A huge wave beats the bow and rips the sail. One of the disciples is seen vomiting over the side. Another one looking directly out at the viewer is a self-portrait of the artist. Only Christ depicted on the right has remained calm. A lady and gentleman in black depicts a man and woman of the times dressed in more formal wear that is solidly black and white. And landscape with obelisk, which we now know is by Govert Flink, and not Rembrandt, depicts a landscape with a twisted tree in the foreground and two persons, one walking and one atop a horse with a small black dog walking beside them. There's a rolling river or stream that cuts through the landscape in the bottom left side of the painting. The obelisk is set just next to the water. The background of the painting is filled with a more mountainous area and large gray clouds fill the sky. The last item taken from the Dutch room was an ancient Chinese bronze goo, which stood about 10 inches tall. It is shaped like an old school bicycle horn in that hourglass shaped way and is brown on the bottom and more black in color toward the top. Traditionally used for serving wine in ancient China, the beaker was one of the oldest works in the museum dating to the Shang dynasty in the 12th century BC. Its estimated value is only several thousand dollars. In the short gallery, five sketches by French artist Edgar Degas were stolen. They were each done on paper less than a square foot in size and made with pencils, inks, washes, and charcoal. They are of relatively little value compared with the other stolen works worth under $100,000 
all five combined. Also taken was a 10-inch tall French Imperial Eagle Finial from the corner of a framed flag for Napoleon's Imperial Guard. There's a $100,000 reward for information leading to the return of the finial alone. It possibly appeared like gold to the thieves. Chaise Tortoni by French painter Edouard Manet was taken from the Blue Room. It was the only item taken from the first floor. And no, I did not pronounce that wrong. This is Manet, which some confuse for Claude Monet, who was the super famous Impressionist painter from the same era. And Monet was actually friends with Edouard Manet. Chaise Tortoni depicts an unidentified gentleman sitting at a table in the Café Tortoni de Paris while drawing on a sketch pad. A half-empty glass of beer stands on the table. The eclectic mix of items has puzzled experts. While some of the paintings were valuable, the thieves passed other valuable works by Raphael and Michelangelo and left them undisturbed, opting to take relatively valueless items like the goo and the finial. The thieves never entered the third floor where Titan's The Rape of Europa hung, which at the time was one of the most valuable paintings in the city. The selection of works and the brutish way that the thieves handled the artwork has led investigators to believe that the thieves were not experts commissioned to steal particular works. As Gardner's will decreed nothing in her collection should be moved, the empty frames for the stolen paintings remain hanging in their prospective locations in the museum as placeholders for their potential return. Because of the museum's low funds and lack of an insurance policy, the director solicited help from Sotheby's and Christie's auction houses to post a reward of $1 million within three days. This was increased to $5 million in 1997. In 2017, it was doubled to $10 million with an expiration date set for the end of the year. This reward was extended following an outpouring of tips from the public. It is the largest bounty ever offered by a private institution. The reward is for information that leads directly to the recovery of all of the items in good condition. Federal prosecutors have stated that anyone who willingly returns the items will not be prosecuted. The statute of limitations expired in 1995 as well, so the thieves and anyone who participated in the theft could no longer be prosecuted. The FBI took immediate control of the case on the grounds that the artwork could likely cross state lines. Investigators have called the case unique for its lack of strong physical evidence. The thieves did not leave behind footprints or hair, and it was inconclusive if the fingerprints left on the scene were from the thieves or museum employees. The FBI has done some DNA analysis in the years following as advancements in the field grew. Some of the evidence has been lost among their files. The guards and witnesses in the street described one thief as around 5 foot 9 inches to 5 foot 10 inches and in his late 30s with a medium build. The other as 6 foot to 6 foot 1 and in his early 30s with a heavier build. Security guard Rick Abbott was investigated early on because of his suspicious behavior on the night of the theft. You will remember that when on his patrol, Abbott briefly opened and shut a side door, a move which some believe could have been a signal to the thieves parked outside. Abbott told authorities that he did this routinely to ensure the door was locked. One of Abbott's colleagues told journalists, that if Abbott had opened the door routinely as he maintains, supervisors would have seen it on computer printouts and put a stop to it. More suspicion has been drawn from the museum's motion detectors, which did not detect any movement in the blue room, which housed Shea Tony, during the 81 minutes the thieves were in the museum. The only footsteps in the room that night were Abbott's during his security patrol. A security consultant reviewed the motion detective equipment several weeks after the theft and determined they were operating correctly. 
Abbott maintains his innocence, and the FBI agent overseeing the case in its early years determined the guards were too incompetent and foolish to have pulled off the crime. In 2015, the FBI released a security video from the museum on the night before the theft, showing Abbott buzzing in an unidentified man into the museum to converse at the security desk. Abbott told investigators he could not recall the incident or recognize the man, and so the FBI requested the public's assistance. Several former museum guards came forward and said the stranger was Abbott's boss, the museum's deputy security chief. Really? You don't remember or recognize your own boss? Another suspect at the time was Whitey Bulger, who was one of the most powerful crime bosses in Boston during the era and headed the Winter Hill Gang. Look for Whitey in a later podcast here on The Secret Sits. Whitey claimed he did not organize the heist and in fact sent his agents out in an attempt to determine who did because the robbery was committed on his turf and he wanted to be paid tribute. FBI agent Thomas McShane investigated Bulger for his involvement. He determined that Bulger's strong ties with the Boston police could explain how the thieves acquired legitimate police uniforms, or perhaps that real police were arranged to do the heist. Bulger also had relations with the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA. McShane identified the bogus tripping of the fire alarm ahead of the heist as a calling card of the IRA and their rival, the Ulster Volunteer Force. Both organizations had agents in Boston at the time, and both had demonstrated capability in the past of pulling off an art heist. McShane's investigation of Bulger and the IRA did not produce any evidence to tie them to the theft. According to Charlie Hill, a retired art and antiquities investigator for the Scotland Yard, Bulger gave the Gardner works to the IRA, and they are most likely in Ireland, though none of this has been substantiated. In 1994, museum director Anne Howley received an anonymous letter from someone who claimed to be attempting to negotiate a return of the artwork. The writer explained that they were a third-party negotiator and did not know the identity of the thieves. They explained that the artwork was stolen to reduce a prison sentence, but as the opportunity had passed, there was no longer a motive to keep the artwork, and they wanted to negotiate a return. The writer explained that the artwork was being held in a non-common law country under climate-controlled conditions. They wanted immunity for themselves and all others involved, and $2.6 million for the return of the artwork, which would be sent to an offshore bank account at the same time the art was handed over. If the museum was interested in negotiating, they should print a coded message in the Boston Globe. To establish credence, the writer conveyed information only known by the museum and the FBI at the time. Howley felt this was a strong lead. She contacted the FBI, who then contacted the Globe, and the coded message was printed on May 1, 1994. Howley received a second letter a few days later in which the writer acknowledged the museum's interest in negotiating, but had become fearful of what they perceived was a massive investigation by federal and state authorities to determine their identity. The writer explained that they needed time to evaluate their options, but Howley never heard from the writer again. Brian McDevitt was a con man from Boston who attempted and failed to rob the Hyde Collection in Glens Falls, New York in 1981. He dressed up as a FedEx driver, carried handcuffs and duct tape, and planned to steal a Rembrandt. He was also a known flag aficionado and fit the description of the larger robber except for his thinning red hair. These parallels to the Gardner case fascinated the FBI so they interviewed him in the late 1990. McDevitt denied any involvement and refused to take a polygraph test. The FBI ran his fingerprints, which did not match any of those at the crime scene. 
McDevitt moved to California after and conned his way into television and film writing. He died in 2004. Next, the FBI moved on to an investigation of the Boston Mafia and the Merlino Gang. The FBI announced significant progress in their investigation in March 2013. They reported with a high degree of confidence that they identified the thieves, which they believe were members of a criminal organization based in the Mid-Atlantic and New England area. They also felt with some confidence that the artwork was transported to Connecticut and Philadelphia in the years following the theft, with an attempted sale in Philadelphia in 2002. Their knowledge of what happened after that is limited, and so they requested the public's help to locate and return the artwork. In 2015, the FBI stated both thieves were deceased. Though the FBI did not publicly identify any individuals, Sources familiar with the investigation said that they were associated with a gang from Dorchester. The gang was loyal to Boston Mafia boss Frank Salome and ran their operations out of an automobile repair shop by criminal Carmelo Merlino. Merlino's associates may have gained knowledge of the museum's weaknesses after gangster Louis Royce cased it as early as 1981. He devised plans with an associate to light up smoke bombs and rush the galleries amidst the confusion. In 1982, when undercover FBI agents were investigating Royce and his associates for an unrelated art theft, they learned of their interest in robbing the Gardner Museum and warned the museum of the gang's plan. Royce was in prison at the time of the robbery, and Roy shared his plans with others, and believes associate Stephen Rossetti may have ordered the robbery or shared it with someone else. Among those associated with the Merlino gang were Robert Guarente and Manchester, Connecticut gangster Robert Gentil. Guarente died from cancer in 2004, but his widow, Ellen, told the FBI in 2010 that her husband had previously owned some of the paintings. She claimed that when her husband got sick with cancer in the early 2000s, he gave the paintings to Gentil for safekeeping. Gentil denied the accusation, claiming he was never given them and knew nothing about their whereabouts. Federal authorities indicted Gentil on drug charges in 2012, likely an attempt to pressure him for information about the Gardner works. He submitted to a polygraph test which indicated he was lying when he denied any knowledge of the theft or location of the artwork. He maintained he was telling the truth and demanded a retest. During the retest, he said that Ellen had once showed him the missing Rembrandt self-portrait, to which the polygraph machine indicated he was telling the truth. Gentil's lawyer felt that the veracity of Gentile's claims were being affected by the large presence of federal agents and requested a smaller meeting in hopes that it would get Gentile to speak honestly. In the more intimate meeting, he maintained that he did not have any information. A few days later, the FBI stormed Gentile's house in Manchester with a search warrant. The FBI found a secret ditch beneath the false floor in the backyard shed but found it empty. His son explained that the ditch flooded a few years prior, and his father was upset about whatever was stored there. In the basement, they found a copy of the Boston Herald from March 1990, reporting the theft along with a piece of paper indicating what each piece might sell for on the black market. Beyond this, no conclusive evidence was found to indicate he might have ever had the paintings. Gentile went to prison for 30 months on drug charges. If he knew information about the theft, at no point did he opt to share it, which would have reduced his sentence or freed him from prison altogether. After getting out of prison, he spoke with investigative reporter Stephen Kirkchian, claiming he was framed by the FBI. He explained how the imprisonment negatively impacted his finances and personal life. He also explained that the list found in his basement was written up by a criminal 
trying to broker return of the works from Guarente, and was talking to Gentile as an intermediary. When asked about what could have been in the ditch, Gentile could not recall, but believed it could have been small motors. David Turner was another associate of Merlino. The FBI began investigating him in 1992 when a source told them Turner had access to the paintings. That same year, Merlino was arrested for cocaine trafficking and told authorities that he could return the paintings for a reduced prison sentence. He asked Turner to track down the paintings, to which Turner was unsuccessful, though he heard that they were in a church in South Boston. Another associate arrested in the drug sting told authorities about Turner's involvement in several break-ins, but never mentioned the Gardner heist. Based on conversations with Merlino, after his release from prison in the mid-1990s, authorities gathered he had never had direct access to the paintings, but possibly could broker for their return. Despite his claims of innocence, the FBI believes he may have been one of the thieves, Evidence indicates that he went back to Florida to pick up a cocaine order just days before the heist, and credit card records suggest he remained there through the night of the robbery. But some investigators believe this may have been Turner's attempt to create an alibi. The FBI thinks the other thief was his friend and Merlino associate, George Reisfelder. He died in July 1991. No clues were found in his apartment or the homes of friends and relatives, but his siblings recall a painting similar to Chase Tortoni in his bedroom. Investigators believe he looked similar to the slimmer of the police sketches. In 1999, the FBI arrested Turner, Merlino, Rossetti, and others in a sting operation the day they planned to rob the Loomis Fargo vault. When the FBI brought Turner in for questioning, they told him they had information that he participated in the Gardner robbery, and that if he returned the paintings, they would let him go. He told the authorities he did not know who stole the paintings, nor where they could be hidden. In his 2001 trial, he claimed entrapment, that the FBI let the Loomis Fargo plot proceed so they could pressure him for information about the Gardner paintings. The jury found him guilty, and he was sent to prison. Turner knew Gentile through Guarente, and in 2010, wrote a letter to Gentile asking if he could call Turner's former girlfriend to assist in recovering the Gardner paintings. In cooperation with the FBI, Gentile spoke with Turner's girlfriend, and she told him that Turner wanted him to speak with two of his ex-convict friends in Boston. The FBI wanted Gentile to meet the men and send an FBI undercover agent with him, but Gentile did not want to cooperate any further. Turner was freed in November 2019, one month after Stephen Rossetti. Merlino died in prison in 2005. Criminal Bobby Donati was murdered in 1991 in the midst of a gang war with the Patriarcha crime family his involvement in the Gardner theft was suspected after notorious New England art thief Miles J. Connor Jr. spoke with authorities. Connor was in jail at the time of the heist, but he believed Donati and criminal David Houghton were the masterminds. Connor had worked with Donati in past art heists and claimed the two cased the Gardner Museum, where Donati took special interest in the Eagle Finial. Connor also claimed that Houghton visited him in jail after the heist and said that he and Donati organized it and were going to use the paintings to get Connor out of jail. If this is true, they likely borrowed the idea from Connor as he returned art to reduce sentences in the past. Even though Donati and Houghton's appearances did not fit in the witness descriptions, Connor suggested they probably hired lower-level gangsters to carry out the robbery. Like Donati, Houghton also died within two years of the robbery, though from an illness rather than murder. Connor told investigators he could assist in returning the Gardner works in exchange for the museum's posted reward 
and his freedom. When investigators did not give in to Connor's demands because of lack of evidence, he suggested they speak with criminal antiquities dealer William P. Youngberth. Acting on Connor's lead, the FBI opened a case on Youngberth and conducted raids on his home and antique store properties in the 1990s. The raids caught the attention of journalist Tom Mashberg, who began talking with Youngberth in 1997 about the theft. One night in August 1997, Youngworth called Mashberg and told him he had proof he could return the Gardner paintings under the right conditions. That night, Youngworth picked up Mashberg from the Boston Herald offices and drove him to a warehouse in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Youngworth led him inside to a storage unit with several large cylinder tubes. He removed one painting from its tube, unfurled it, and showed it to Mashberg under a flashlight. It appeared to Mashberg to be the storm on the Sea of Galilee. He noticed cracking along the canvas, and the edges were cut in a manner consistent with the museum's reports, as well as Rembrandt's signature on the ship's rudder. Mashberg wrote about his experience in the Boston Herald, leaving out details to hide Youngworth's identity and the painting's location. He reported that his informant, presumably Youngworth, told him the robbery was pulled off by five men and identified two of them. Donati was one of the robbers, and Houghton was responsible for moving the art to a safe house. The FBI discovered the location of the warehouse several months later and raided it, finding nothing. The veracity of Youngworth's claims and the authenticity of the painting shown to Mashberg is under dispute. Youngworth supplied paint chips to Mashberg, and federal authorities reported that they were indeed from Rembrandt's era, but did not match oils used for the storm on the Sea of Galilee. The way Mashberg described the painting as being unfurled also has been scrutinized, as the stolen paintings were covered with a heavy varnish that would not roll easily. Federal authorities and the museum began working with Youngworth after Mashberg's story was published, but Youngworth made negotiations difficult. He would not work with authorities unless his demands could be met, which included full immunity and Connor's release from jail. The authorities were skeptical of Youngworth's veracity and only offered partial immunity. The United States attorney overseeing the case eventually ceased talks with Youngworth unless he could provide more reliable evidence that he had access to the Gardner works. Youngworth again provided a vial of paint chips, purportedly from the storm on the Sea of Galilee, and 25 color photographs of the painting A Lady and a Gentleman in Black. A joint statement from the museum and federal investigators announced that the chips were not from the stolen Rembrandts, though they did test as being from the 17th century and could potentially have been from the concert. In 2014, investigative reporter Stephen Kirchian wrote to gangster Vincent Ferrara, Donati's superior during the gang war, inquiring if he had any information about the Gardner theft. He received a call back from an associate of Ferrara who explained that the FBI was wrong in suspecting the Merlino's gang involvement and claimed that Donati organized the robbery. The caller explained that Donati visited Ferrara in jail about three months before the theft, after the latter was charged with murder, and told Ferrara that he was going to do something to get him out of jail. Three months later, Ferrara heard the news about the Gardner theft, after which Donati visited him again and confirmed to Ferrara that he was involved in the robbery. He claimed to have buried the artwork and would start a negotiation for his release once the investigation cooled down. The negotiations never occurred because Donati was murdered. Kirchian believes Donati was motivated to free Ferrara from prison because Ferrara could protect him in the gang war. A friend of Guarente 
also corroborated that Donati organized the robbery, and that Donati gave paintings to Guarente when he became concerned for his own safety. Donati was close friends with Guarente. The two were seen in a social club in Rivery shortly before the robbery with a bag of police uniforms. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum has issued the following statement. Despite some promising leads in the past, the Gardner theft of 1990 remains unsolved. The museum, the FBI, and the U.S. Attorney's Office are still seeking viable leads that could result in safe return of the art. The museum is offering a reward of $10 million for information leading directly to the recovery of all 13 works in good condition. A separate reward of $100,000 is being offered for the return of the Napoleonic Eagle Finial. Anyone with information about the stolen artworks or the investigation should contact the Gardner Museum directly. Confidentiality and anonymity is guaranteed. You can contact them directly at theft at gardnermuseum.org. So, where are these pieces of art lost to the world? Well, if you have a secret and you would like to make a ton of money, remember that the statute of limitations has already run out for this crime. So you likely won't get into trouble and you just might add $10 million to your bank account. I'm John Dodson, and this has been The Secret Sits. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original artwork provided by Tony Leigh.